So, dann. Ja. Thanks for the feedback. So, then 1815, let's start with the meetup. So, too many buttons. So, welcome to today's uh, to net meetup, our July edition. Uh, hope you're all doing well. Um, yeah, as always, <laughs> uh, the meetup is hosted by us, the NetDevs.at, your non-profit association whose purpose is to spread and the knowledge and experience about the usage of those technologies. You can find us, oh, we have a website, you can find us on Twitter, you can find us on Twitch, YouTube. And, and Slack. Um, here are the links. Um, yeah, thanks to all for joining us today. Uh, we have a cool, cool talk uh, today uh, about EF Core hidden gems. Um, we have also thanks to our sponsors, and we have a new one. We have as in the last month, tier to every as a sponsor. And we have now also JetBrains as a sponsor. JetBrains is sponsoring one uh, license of the products per meetup. And we will uh, shuffle it uh, after the talk. Uh, and one lucky uh, person of you, um, yeah, will get this 12 months. Uh, license. Um, first, some news from the community. Um, most of you probably already know about the Azure Heroes um, program uh, to collect these collectibles for uh, community activities. And there is now, because we're in the summer, there is now a summer learner patch uh, you can get. Uh, here is the link uh, to the badge. And if you want more information about Azure Heroes, uh, it's, it's here. Or um, you can also um, ask uh, Christian Schweiger. Uh, I hope I didn't butcher his name now. Um, perhaps he's in the, in the chat. Um, he's the Microsoft developer community guy and if you have questions you can go to him. Um, we have also some interesting events in the future. Um, um, in two weeks we, there is the virtual Azure Community Day on the 28th of July. Two days afterwards there is a .NET Conf on, with focus on microservices. Um, and um, Microsoft Austria has some cloud data and AI, AI hands-on labs uh, in the next uh, weeks. And they are all free. So all of these three events are free. Uh, yeah, you can join remotely. Um, good. And that was, was it already from me. So now uh, let's go to our talk, EF Core Hidden Gems by Igor. So we are doing this today different. We are using Zoom today. Don't ask us why. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, no, that was the wrong window. So you should now see and hear here. Uh, eager, eager, and let's make make me disappear. So, Igor, um, your stage. Thanks, Andy. Thanks a lot. So, let us start uh, with the topic: empty framework core hidden gems. Stories behind why I actually did this talk. So, um, this is my brother and myself. Uh, quite some years ago, 
I think it's obvious it's quite some years ago and I can't remember anymore what but I can show you how how they look like now. Uh, this is an excerpt from an email my brother sent to me once uh, saying that for him, like the quality of the entity framework core is doubtful. He doubts in the quality of entity framework core because some essential things, like very basic things and essential things like TPH are not there. They are not supported, whatever TPH is. I found it funny, so I put it here like in my mother tongue because these kind of talks I have quite often, not only with my brother, uh, he's a heavy user of some other ORMs and we discuss it quite often, but not only with him, like this question, like can the framework core, like I know it's a version three something already, but is it really ready? How many, many features it has? And then that constant, uh, a constant comparison, for example, with entity framework, with, a, uh, with the classic version of entity framework. Another one example, this happened to me. I was searching for entity framework core views. This is actually what I wanted to type in to find out some things. And I, I found it interesting that Google um, uh, suggested the entity framework core versus entity framework core six. Like this is something you actually want to, want to learn more about. I was thinking honestly about clicking on a re uh, uh, to report inappropriate prediction because for me it was definitely inappropriate prediction. I'm well aware of that, that entity framework core, especially for those who are coming from other ORMs is, uh, is uh, questionable in a sense, are the old features there and so on. But at the same time, I see something else when I visit my customers that who use Entity Framework Core, that they are not aware of many features which are there. And that's why I call them hidden gems. So uh, out of those 101 marbles in this case, like supported features, today we are going to talk about some, at least in my experience, which are somewhere I would say down there on, on the bottom of this bag. I do not see them in practice as much as I would expect to see them. Uh, the first thing I wanna start with is of course performance. My, my favorite topic, because, uh, yeah, uh, this is what we sell to our customers, super fast, um, you know, super sexy when it comes to our applications. But then um, I will not discuss what they sometimes get, especially when it comes to database performance and so on. There is one very simple feature, very easy to use, and it's called ASNO tracking. Uh, and I see it really, really rarely. So I want to start with this one and tell you a bit what is it about. Um, I have a couple of examples here. And um, in this very simple example, it's really simple. I have an entity. It's an author with the first name, middle name, and last name. And let's say it's, then I have something called author service, a kind of architecture uh, which one can often see. So in author service, I have two kinds of things. I have some methods which simply gives me the, the authors. Uh, DB context, and they simply do some query and give the things back. Or I have also I have also methods that change something. This is an artificial example, but it shows you the idea. So I will get the authors from the context, and then I will do some logic. In this case, I will skip the first one and then do some change change the first name and the middle name of the others, um, and then I will save the changes. A really typical thing get something, uh, do something, save changes. Uh, let me start the example uh, to see what we actually get and what entity framework does in the background when we these, do these things. Um, it's rather simple. So when we get the authors, entity framework will execute the select command, nothing special here, and it will give us back the authors. The authors are here, by the way, Nobel Prize winners from all the countries where I, where I gave the talk so far. And uh, let's now call the other method, uh, which changes the authors. So do something with authors. Now here the things are getting much more interesting. So what happened? Uh, you will see here, if you take a closer look, you will see here that we have three updates. So uh, three updates are sent to the database, okay? And they are different. So in the first update, Entity Framework is changing the first name. In the second update, it changes first name and the middle name. And in the third, again, just the first name. So we loaded four objects and three of them are getting back to the database with different updates. 
update command. Hmm, interesting. That means that entity framework knows uh, what we changed. And really, if I uh, read the authors again, you will see that the first one is not touched at all. And then on the, on the next one, we have either first name or first name and the middle name changed. Uh, the question is, most likely you never ask yourself that, how is this possible? Because if you take a look at this code here, I'm not giving Entity Framework any kind of hint what am I changing. Yeah, so how Entity Framework knows when I call save changes right here, what has to be, what, what is changed and what has to be changed in the database, what kind of query to send. Yeah. Uh, this is an internal feature of Entity Framework called tracking. So uh, what, what, does it, what does it do? Uh, once when you uh, access some entities from the Entity Framework, and, and start iterating or in general load them from the database. Entity framework will load them, create, create the objects and so on in the memory, but at the same time, it will create a snapshot of the original data which was loaded from the database. And of course, depending on that, how, how much data you have and how, how it's structured and so on, creating this snapshot and also the memory consumption of this snapshot can be significant. Yeah. Uh, uh, finally, uh, when you go for save changes, entity, data, entity Framework will compare the set of objects which is getting yeah, with the snapshot and decide then what are the changes and so on. This is a bit simplified view. There are much more going on in the background. Snapshot, that's not easy. You know, it has to do something to create the snapshot and it will keep it in the memory as long as you work with the context. Usually, whenever we change data, like in this method, uh, like in this method, do something with authors, this is something what we want. We want this magic. My issue with the feature, with the built-in feature by default, are these line of codes. I would say, out of my experience, roughly, in such a service classes or whatever the layer is toward the database, I would say roughly 80% of, of the, uh, of the uh, communication to entity framework is read only, like in this case. So we are fetching the authors, we have uh, some query, we are, we are passing them and so on, but we are not changing them. We know that we will not change them. Uh, that means entity framework will also in this line create a snapshot, which will, as not tracking, is a feature which allows you to tell entity framework these data which I'm fetching now is read only. I will never write it back. Yeah. Uh, it's a simple performance imp uh, improvement because you will simply get, give a hint to entity framework, don't create the snapshots and do all the heavy, heavy load and work regarding that. So how does it look like? It's extremely easy to use it. Um, I have it here in the I'll example. You can, uh, do it, you can do it per query. And it's it's fairly simple. So the only thing you have to you, the only thing you have to do is um, is do this. Simply say whatever in your query as not tracking, and that's the only thing you have to do. So whenever you not save the data back, which you're fed, as not tracking gives a hint to entity framework to to optimize the things in the background. Yeah. Because of that ratio, which I see. But most of the queries are actually read-only. What I usually suggest is the following. Put this as not tracking as a default. Seriously. That means turn off the magic. How can you do that? Um, uh, you, can, you can do that uh, in the configuration of your uh, context. So there is an option called use query tracking behavior. Uh, you, can, you can see it here. So the use query tracking behavior. And if you say that the query tracking behavior is no tracking, this part, this part here, entity framework will by default turn off the magic. Yeah. It could be confusing uh, if, you are, if you're not aware of it because suddenly if you load the objects, you, you, uh, you change them and you save them back, uh, nothing, will be, nothing will be sent to the database. So what you have to do in this case, if you turn uh, no tracking as a default, what you have to do in this case uh, is other way around. In the cases, in the cases where you need the mouse, in the cases where you need 
tracking, you have to put it explicitly. So in this particular case, you can see here in this line that I'm saying I'm getting the authors for this time as tracking. I understand the reasoning why the defaults are different, but I would say saving something here makes sense and it's very easy to use. Uh, just to give you, give you um, an idea, uh, it depends heavily on what kind of data you have and what you're doing with the database. But this is, a one, uh, this is a one performance measurement I found online. It was for Entity Framework 6, but let's say it's comparable. What you can see in this particular data, smaller is better. 66% less memory usage and like 20% execution time. Please take all this with a, with a pinch of salt. Uh, your mileage may vary. It really depends on what kind of data you have. But this is a something, a feature I see very, very rarely. Uh, very, very rarely used. And it definitely makes sense to use it. Yeah. Um, are there any questions? Feel free to ask questions at any time. So Andy will bring them. Uh, to me, also feel free to ask them uh, later on, so I will answer them on the go. Yeah. And then, I'm not sure, are there, are there any questions? Not yet. <laughs> not yet. Perfect. That means everything's clear. Cool. So, um, and uh, let me move to the next topic. Uh, the next topic is one of my favorite in general because in practice uh, it's somehow always always there. Uh, on one side, when we are talking about core and .NET Core and everything related to .NET Core, we are talking about the new world. You know, we are talking about microservices, super scalable, uh, super performant, and so on. But at the same time, in reality, at least in, in my consultancy reality, we have to live with legacy systems at the same time. Uh, it is simply like that. Often we put uh, we put um, uh, new services on the top of an existing database, for example. And now this is a this is a challenging situation because you have the new world. You have your nice objects and so on, which you want to model. But at the at the end, you do not own the database. It's already there, and maybe it's modeled in a way which is not 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 optimal. Yeah, you know, we call it history, you know, because of historical reasons. Um, there are plenty of uh, techniques how to bridge the gap between these two worlds. And today I want to discuss two of them. Uh, the first one, the first one is called value conversions. Yeah. What are value conversions? Who? I'll take a I'll take a concrete example uh, because I've seen it so many times and it was always like question for me how this happened. Uh, and in all the, all the talks I gave so far, uh, people are always saying, yep, we see them as well. Yeah. Let me state it like this. Pro programmers were always very creative when it, ca uh, when it came to writing Booleans to the database. I've seen really a lot of crazy things like, you know, like yes and no, the strings, most the strings, sometimes one minus one. Uh, don't, uh, don't ask me why, but you know, like in German that you have yeah, and nine like J and N. I, I guess you encounter something like that, uh, something like that as well. So what we have in this case is in the database for whatever historical reason, we have a data type which does not semantically fit to that what we want to have in our objects. Yeah. And what I see, uh, I would say often or not, but way, way too, way too, uh, way too, way too many cases that what we do. We create the model out of the database and it stays like it is, maybe changed a bit. Yeah, We took the generated one. That's not the idea. So we want to have a new, new world model, proper mo model, uh, model properly and use entity framework to bridge the gap. In this particular case, what we have is the following situation. We have a Boolean in our model. That's what we want to have. And we have some craziness in the database. And the question is how to bridge the gap. And here's where the value conversions come in, uh, pretty simple thing to use. So let me see our Boolean conversions. I have a funny entity here, it's called B true, okay? And it consists only of various properties. They're all of type bool, okay? But in the database, none of them is uh, actual type of type bool, yeah, the first one, the true false one. Uh, so in the database, they're persisted in a various way, like one minus one, like zero one, like in my language, uh, 
uh, my mother tongue, yes, no, yes, no, yeah, nine, and so on, and so on. And I have some interesting thing, like, because everybody has their her own truth. I have my own truth, also my completely crazy way how to write buildings, yeah. So how does it look in the background? Um, I'm going to show it to you uh, here in the context. So what I want to do is I want to teach entity framework to understand that there is a gap and to bridge it. And here is the, where the value converters come in. So it's pretty simple to use. If I take a look on the first example, I have my property one minus one, okay? And what I'm telling to entity framework is this line, this is the crucial line, that it has a conversion. And this is the bool to two values converter. And intuitively you can guess already what it is. Uh, so the first value which you provide here is the false value and the, the second one is the true value. And that's all you have to do. Uh, you, will see, you will see later on what entity framework does with it. But this line teaches entity framework to apply so-called conversion. Yeah. Um, other examples are similar. So if you take a look here, again, I'm simply saying zero, 01. Uh, in this case, we have both a string converter uh, with all possible combinations. For me, just the fact that there are so many of these built-in converters, they come with entity framework core, tells me that this is this is definitely not, not in my part of the universe that people were doing crazy things with buildings, yeah. So you can use these so-called built-in converters to tell the entity framework, turn my bull into something, uh, my bull into something different, yeah. Uh, let's take a look what happens in the, let's take a look what happens in the, in the background when we, uh, when we actually when we actually do that. So uh, in my example, what I'm doing is the following. Just to the context, saving them, and then uh, I'm just um, executing a simple query. Okay, so let's see what we got here. Good. When adding them to the database, I will just point out these parts here. So you can see that the size of the data and the database type in 32 and size 11 and Boolean and so on are completely different. Okay. So that means during insert entity framework, we are, we are passing Booleans in the code, but the entity framework is inserting the data which, which was specified to be, uh, to be on the other side. Yeah. Uh, that's that's one thing, and then later on when you read the data, you can see a similar thing. Now it looks a bit messy, but it's not. It's very very simple to understand. I had a simple where clause where I was um, where I was comparing them with true, and you can see that entity framework. What entity framework did? Entity framework did the conversion on the fly. So for example. Uh, we'll take a look on my own truth later on, but you can see here that uh, ya9 is actually compared with ya instead of with, with true. So this is what entity framework then does on the fly and is clever enough to form the queries, fetch the data and do the conversion other way around. So if I load this, I will, uh, I will get my object and it will have a value, one of the values uh, uh, set to true when I get it from the database. The interesting thing is you can see the select when, it, when the data comes from the database. Uh, it comes in the in the format, of course, stored in the database. Conversion is done uh, on the client side. Yeah. Um, that would be the essence of the feature. So we have different data types, and we provide something called converter, which teaches entity framework how to how to bridge the gap. Uh, it's not exactly that simple, but already this is more than useful. Uh, let me now show you how you can uh, different ways to define these converters. Uh, one of them have uh, you have seen already. This is simply using the built-in converters. But there is another one, uh, another one way. I told you that I have my own truth, of course. Everybody has it. Uh, I can define a conversion like in place, like like this. Yeah. Using it, some of your conversion, uh, there is a class called uh, value converter. You can see it there, uh, and uh, you can you can pack this conversion within an instance of a value converter 
and then simply use that instance uh, in the highest conversion method later on. So if you take a look here, here is what you here is what you get. Uh, these are the simplest ways to to create your own conversions, and this is in the if you need anything more than this, maybe the conversions are not 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 the best solution to to that what you what you need. Yeah? Good. Um, so we scratched the surface of the feature. Uh, just solving this issue with booleans is for me already awesome. But there are some other things here. So uh, there are other built-in converters, quite some of them. And for me, those converters that convert to string are very interesting because um, because that's that's what I'm that's what I've seen um, in in practice that. Certain data types are forever, for historical reason, stored as, str as strings. So just to give you an idea, uh, just to give you an idea, uh, what kind of something to string converters you have for for further exploration. Uh, for example, date time to string converter. Okay, when you have date times stored in the database uh, as string, uh, then you have some other here. For example, a number to string converter for number data types. Seen often that enumerations are say the string. Yeah. And in this case, I have a, a entity which has some enumeration and it has also some, some flag, flag enumeration. Yeah. Uh, as you can imagine in the background, the table has columns which are all strings. And um, in, the, in the model, we have date, time, GUID, and so on. Now, uh, what I want to tackle now a bit is this all looks nice, but it's not that it's not that perfect as it as it seems. All of these building conversions, which uh, convert to string, you have to take them cautiously. For example, date, time to string converter. Uh, you can see you can see here in the in the constructor that I'm not giving any format or something. So how that string looks like, yeah? the format is hard coded. Hmm, it's not useful, I have to say. So um, when it comes to strings in the data, uh, when it comes to date time as string in the database, what I've often seen, there were like special formats which were used to, to present date mostly, not, not date time, date mostly in the database. So if I cannot specify that format, hmm, uh, it's not that useful. Similar thing to GUI to string converter. Um, it is um, mostly use string representation of a GUID, but we know that that's not the only one, the, 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 the D one. Uh, and uh, if you need something else, it, uh, it, you cannot use it. Yeah. Luckily, this kind of conversion uh, converters can be written easily on our own, uh, the way I, I show you before. Yeah. Uh, you have to also be um, uh, you have to also be very careful because of some other reasons, which I will show you now. So whenever you use the converters, you have to understand that there are certain limitations, uh, either with built-in converters or those and with, uh, on your own. So I, I prepared here a simple example, which shows some uh, which shows some limitations. So just to give you an idea, what what do I have here? Uh, I have some entity, and it has some integer. Okay, and that some integer is mapped to string in the database. So in the value conversion, you will see here uh, in this line that um, some entity is an integer and it's mapped to it's mapped to string. Looks looks fine. So what I'm doing in the in the example, just to show you uh, the possible the possible issues and the limitations, what I'm doing in the example is the following. I'm creating some I'm creating some entities and I'm putting inside negative numbers, okay, from minus uh, from minus four to, to to zero, yeah, and then I'm trying to get some int with minus four. Then I'm trying to get those which are uh, uh, smaller than minus four and so on. I'm doing some queries, yeah. Uh, let's take a look. Uh, let's take a look how it how it works. Yeah. <clears throat> um, and you will see now some surprising results. Um, one one yes. short moment. Uh, there's some problem with the stream. Let me let me restart it to to make it better. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, I'll wait a bit. Just let me know when I can proceed. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so should work now again. So what I'm doing here, I have this object inside. Um, yeah, still said so that the internet connection is not the best, but yeah, let's hope it will work. Yes. Good. Thanks. Uh, I have um, I have these integers inside stored as strings, and now I'm fetching the one where sum int is equal to four, and this is the query which entity framework does. And what you can see here in the where clause, which is interesting, is that it properly um, compares sum int with uh, with sum int, and it gets the value back. The issue here is that this is a string comparison because some int is string in the database and this is also into the database. In this case, it will work. But when, I, when I'm trying to fetch those which are um, uh, less than, fetch those which are less than zero, I'm getting the result uh, that there are, no, there are no entities with some int less than zero, which is not true because I put them minus one, minus two, and so on to minus four. Where is the issue? Again, this comparison here is a string comparison in the database. So that's not an integer comparison. And, and in a string comparison, um, uh, the, they, are, they, are, uh, they are actually the, the, the zero as a string is less than minus one as a string. Yeah. To make it even crazier, uh, what I'm doing in the last example, I'm ordering my entities by some int. So you can see it in the you can see it in the example. What I'm doing here, I'm, I have a single, very very simple query where I order by by some int. Yeah, and I would expect, of course, to have them properly ordered. But if you take a look uh, at the example, when I when we fetch them, by but this is ordered by integer, and you have a completely uh, different result than the one you would expect. Now, the moral of the story is value converters, nice, but once you start messing these values with queries, you can have some strange results. And this is the area in which it's better better not to go. Uh, the the risk the risk is there. For example, in in cases like the previous, that you will you will hardly you will hardly spot the error. So. Get any kind of exception on it of, or anything, but you will have an issue in the business logic. Yeah. So the question is where to draw the line because uh, on one side, value converters it is one of my favorite features. It's really useful. On the other side, it has some limitations, and if you are not cautious, uh, uh, they can cause risks. Actually, risk in a sense of getting wrong algorithms. The good thing is, Entity Framework Core team works on this feature, and they continually uh, improve. Um, in this area, how to get the queries, how to get the queries better and better. So, my conclusion for this feature, I encourage usually the usage, but also I always say uh, take a, take a take a good look and care that they are the 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 properties which are mapped with value converters that they are not used in queries. Yeah. If uh, the usually I avoid anything but this simple. Um, Equality, equalities in queries. They they usually work. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now there is another one. Igor, one, one, one moment. We have another technical problem. Oh. Give give me a moment. Uh, let's try it again. No. Oh.
Let's wait a little bit if it's working again. Mm -hmm. Good. Just first feedback coming back that it's better. Better, okay. Then let's try to continue. Let's try to continue. So I apologize for technical issues here. These kind of things you never know. But just let us know. So if uh, something's not working, we will we will do a break and then proceed. Yeah. Okay. So this much about the value conversions. I'm not sure. Are there any questions? Uh, meanwhile, the chat. Didn't saw any about. Uh, no. Conversion only about uploads and buffering. <laughs> okay, so that's good. That means everything's clear. Yeah. Anyhow, feel free to uh, to ask questions. All the topics. Uh, the next one I want to discuss are keyless entity types. Now, keyless entity types uh, were uh, they were introduced in uh, in version two zero under with uh, with another another name, liquidity like types. And um, uh, starting from version 3.0 from Entity Framework Core, they are called keyless entity types. But anyhow, they were, they were, in my opinion, one of those really, really useful features. What is it about? Uh, regardless of having a legacy database or even starting with Entity Framework Core and then working on a new project, the, the probability that you will sooner or later need a view, for example, in a database is there. I can. I hardly remember that I've ever seen an existing database that didn't have views in it, which we wanted to use, of course, in Entity Framework. And uh, up to Entity Framework 2, uh, views were not the first-class citizens. So the entities were the, were the types with keys, with IDs, and Entity Framework supposed that it can read them and, and write, write them back. So the views were not supported in a sense that if you wanted to get something from the view, you were forced to... to uh, write SQL or whatever. Now this changed dramatically uh, for better with keyless entity types. What is it about? Uh, just to give you an idea, so um, I have a model, very simple model with a blog, and the blog has blog posts. Yeah. And let's say that it's really uh, mission critical that we know how many, how many, um, how each blog, how, how many posts it, it has. And you no, know, for the millions of blog, whatever, uh, we have a view in the database where the blog post count is stored. Yeah. And uh, that's simply view in the database. So um, I'm mapping this to something called blog post count. And as you can see, this class blog post count does not have an ID. It's not an entity. So it has uh, it has the blog ID. And it has the block title and number of posts, but it's just a, just the data, the, the uh, really the projection of the data. But there is no ID, there is no key, so I would consider it to be keyless. Yeah. And what I want to tell to Entity Framework is map this to the view in the database. Once you do it, I want to use my block post count just as every other uh, every other entity within the database context. And I will show you now how this works. It's very simple. Very mighty. It actually makes views the first class citizen. Yeah. So uh, just to give you an idea, um, I have my database here, and this is how the view looks like. I'm simply creating it. So from blogs, and I have some joins and groupings and so on. But at the end, uh, in the view, I have ID, I have title, and I have something called PSD count. Okay. Uh, as you can see again, I say let them in, in, in C, C sharp. So I want to teach my entity framework that my blog post count object, plain old C sharp object, should be mapped to a uh, to a row within within this view. Yeah. Uh, and I want to be able to query them in the same way I, I query entities. To achieve that with keyless entity types, it's really, really simple. So how it works? Uh, you will treat blog post count as a normal DB set. So what you can see here in this line, I'm simply saying I have a DB set of blog post count. That's the first step. The second is, the second 
uh, the second step is to tell entity framework that the blog post count is actually keyless, that it's not entity uh, uh, that can be written back. It has no key. Again, very simple. You simply have to say has no key and you have to tell the entity framework where it is. In this particular case, it's in the view called the view blog post counts. And that's it. If you don't want to have any additional mappings or anything, this is, this is in general enough. Yeah. Uh, again, out of my experience in, in legacy databases, you usually want to map the columns and so on. So this is what I'm doing here. I'm, I'm mapping the columns uh, because they have different names, but that's exactly the same. So once you say has no key and you map it to the view, uh, you're you are ready to go. What does it mean? Uh, you can see now how uh, you can see now how I use uh, this blog post, uh, how I use this blog post count, and you can see it in this. Uh, you can see it in this line here. So I have my context, access blog post, access blog post count, and the rest is same as with regular uh, entities. I can simply build my query. In this case, it's a where and so on. Exactly the same. Exactly the same experience with uh, like with entities. And what you get in the background, I will start it, but it's an accepted, uh, it's exactly what we, what we accept. accept. Um, entity framework core will build a query uh, which goes against the view. So you can see here that it's getting it from view, yeah? And the rest is of course where and so on. So uh, this, is, this is in essence everything. Uh, why I like this feature is because it's really mighty. When I compare it with the, the world before this feature, you know, getting something from the view where the views were not the first class citizens, was definitely cumbersome. And with this feature, very, very simple um, intuitive steps, uh, we can get direct, direct access to, to the views uh, in the database. So something which I definitely recommend. Okay, any questions? No, later. No in the chat. No in the chat. Good. Okay. Uh, that's it. There is a one feature somehow similar to keyless entity types. So I have it here. It's called defining queries. But since this is a bit shorter version of the talk, I will skip that one. But don't worry. Uh, the examples are the examples are online. Uh, my GitHub account and uh, you have readme files everywhere. So in the readme files. I link to the documentation and to some additional material where you can take a look. So the uh, keyless entity types we discuss and the defining queries, the gem number four, I will skip it for now, uh, but it's quite intuitive, especially when you uh, it's, it's done to be comparable to the examples, uh, to example I've, uh, I've just shown. Okay, and I would like to move to another one topic. So these were few, let's say heavier features I want to show you one very, very simple one, which somehow I would like to see him being more used. Uh, it would make my life easier in certain uh, situations. It's connected to diagnostics. It's a very, very simple, uh, relaxing feature, I would say. Uh, let me show you what it is. Uh, it's called query tags. Uh, so uh, what is it about? Problem. Wrong one. Uh, what, are, what are query tags? Just take a look at this. Um, so if there are any issues with entity framework with the performance and so on, I usually want to, want to see how the output of the entity framework looks like. And sometimes it's literally like this, intermixed with other trees and so on, it's impossible to figure out what's going on here, okay? Uh, query tags are a very simple feature which allows you to tag the queries with some meaningful textual information. And what it does, it's superly for, for diagnostic purpose, it will simply add this information uh, in, the, uh, in, the, in the log output atomically together with the query. So I have here some meaningful description of the query number eight and some additional meaningful description of the query number eight. Yeah, And here is the query number eight. Uh, much easier to figure out if, of course, like every login, like every login, if you do it well and if you put it in, in use well, uh, you can make your diagnostic 
uh, diagnostics easier. Uh, how it's used, it's very simple. So the query tags are um, really simple. So to take a look at the examples. Uh, so what I did is just this tag with. So let's take a look. The features, uh, the, the method is called tag with, and you just pass a string. Uh, uh, you just pass a string to it, and this string will be attached to the log output. Nothing. If it's put in the proper places to to help you, it's it's useful to know it's useful to know that it's there. Yeah. Yeah. Very simple feature, just say for relaxing. But again, something uh, I I don't see in the, in the while also in the examples where I would expect to to see. Good. Now, these were, these were the query tags. I want to move on now to one, say, a hot philosophical topic. Hmm. Uh, discussions I also uh, often have. I don't know if you know what this build, uh, what this um, image represents, and I hope you do not, yeah, because, um, you know, very healthy, we, we, sh we should not be in contact with these kind of images. Uh, it shows anemic blood. Uh, it shows, let's say, a, a blood, blood with, which lacks um, red blood cells, means uh, does not fulfill its purpose. It is blood, but it does not fulfill its purpose, you know, like carrying oxygen and so on to, to, to the cells. Why am I showing this, this image? Uh, there is a term coined by Marty Fowler, one of the most influential, definitely, individuals in our in industry, called anemic domain model. So this is anemic domain model. You know what the domain model is? You know, like how we how we structure like our business objects and so on, and, and build our, our domain, especially in the DDD world. Now, what would be a do an anemic one? Yeah. Uh, sort of part of it, part of its purpose. objects which are found in that anemic model yeah uh, and what he's saying is that they have this this term like bags bags of gathers and setters I find it very interesting because if you take a look at my examples on each and every example I've, I've shown so far what is a customer a bag of gathers and setters I can I can Pull out any of the examples I had here, for example, um, in the in the queries blog, it's a bag of kittens and setters. If you go to MSDN, uh, you will see only such examples. So examples for entity frameworks are: you have a class and it has kittens and setters inside. I you will rarely see a method, so it's definitely this what uh, he um, he's saying. Uh, he's calling an anti-pattern. Okay, and asking why it's so common. I have to say in a real life, it's very, very often to have like domain objects built exactly this way. I will not go now into details. Uh, is this an anti pattern? Yes or no? To which extent? Why is it so common? Uh, when it's beneficial? I have another one, another one talk to that topic about the entity framework uh, um, architecture in general. But he's saying it's anti pattern and why it's so common. What's interesting today for me is this sentence, saying that some technologies, technologies encourage it. Yeah. Now, this is an interesting point because in discussions I sometimes have, uh, people argue that ORMs, and especially mighty ORMs like Entity Framework Core, they actually encourage this way of programming because if I want to map something to the database, I have to have gathers and setters, and that, that's it. Using, using Entity Framework Core. Now, what I want to show you now is that that's not true. Uh, entity Framework Core, this is one really of the, I would say, hidden, hidden gems, can do much more than just mapping uh, mapping public properties with, with getters and setters. And the examples I want to show you now uh, demonstrate that. The first thing is a feature called Entity Constructors. So if we are building usually in a DD, uh, D-way, our objects and so on. Sometimes we have this, like, I have my constructor and there is no default one. 
have to supply certain information. It has to be valid just to, to create the object. Yeah. And Entity Streamer Core supports such scenarios. So let me show you uh, what is it about. So Entity Constructor, what I have here um, is um, an entity framework. Uh, uh, it's a one, a one entity, which has property called some property and some other property. Uh, you can see them. You can see them below. The interesting thing is uh, there is no public setter on them. Okay, that's one thing. And the other thing is I have to use constructor. I have to provide them in the constructor. The only one I have. I do not have the default one. So the only one I have is this one here, and I have to provide some property and some other property. Okay. Uh, Entity framework core understands these kind of situations, and it will. During construction of objects, it will call this. It will call this constructor. Yeah, uh, that's one example. I have another one here. I, I, you will see later on what you uh, have, have to do and uh, how to how to map it. In this case, uh, it's also interesting because I have uh, my object, and in this case, I do not have properties at all. So I have some value as. Uh, read only uh, as read only values like something with, um, in, in objects where, where they are like really properly modeled with behavior and so on uh, with, um, as as objects and in this case uh, it will work as well so entity framework will recognize that there are these fields and it will uh, call the it will call the uh, uh, constructor and uh, instead of setting these fields now how this looks like and what we have to do to get this feature running, again, like I would say 99% of the things in Entity Framework Core, it's, it's really simple. So in the first example, with the constructor with the properties, uh, the only thing uh, you have to do is, since the property didn't have a public setter, you have to explicitly set to Entity Framework, I have this property. Yeah, because it will not be picked up automatically. That's the only thing you have to do. In the second case, uh, since the, the, we don't have properties, we have fields which are private. Uh, the way to do it is the following. So you can see it. You can see it here. Uh, so uh, to uh, so you can you can see it here. This is the way how you tell to Entity Framework there is a field named some value, and I want to map it, of course, then on the column and so on. This is a typical thing so that Entity Framework picks it up. What's interesting in the example, the constructor will be recognized automatically. Automatically, It's, um, uh, it's based, uh, it's convention, I'm sorry, I just want to go to this one. So in both cases, it's convention based. So uh, here, sorry. And uh, the convention is, you know, like uh, some property with a small s will map to some property with capital or capitalized capitalized s. There are some other combinations which are supported, but that's that's how it works. And again, most of the cases, it will fit. Uh, if I run, I run this example, uh, you will see what it's doing. Just go to the example in the program. What I'm what I'm doing is I'm creating those entities, and since um, uh, um, I'm, I'm, create, I'm just creating the entities using the constructor and so on. And uh, later on, I'm getting them from the database. And once I get them from the database, you will see that entity framework core called the pro appropriate constructor. So here it is. The, yes, uh, these lines. So let me show you. Um, entity with constructors, constructor call. Yeah. It's very simple. The major thing I wanted to show here is you do not need to have um, parameter, uh, uh, default constructors, constructors with, without parameters in order uh, for entity framework core to work. Yeah. The other example is even mightier, I would say, or more important, uh, it's called backing fields. That means uh, let me ignore properties altogether, or if I have them, I want to have these rich properties with the logic in them and so on. 
with back in, back in fields, uh, with, with um, um, yeah, back in fields in the, in the background. So what is it about? In this example, I'm simulating, let's say, objects or entities with, with rich logic. That means properties will have a rich logic. Uh, here it is, the one with, with, with properties. And then I have, a, I have a methods inside and so on, something which we, will, we would expect in DDD. So there are no getters and setters you know, uh, publicly available. So I have some um, methods which give me the values or I have, for example, some, uh, again, methods which change the values. They have some very serious logic and so on. The interesting thing here is this is an entity without properties. The, the, major, the major idea, I have only fields inside. Yeah. And everything is hidden. I can encapsulate it um, any, any, way, any way I want. The only thing I have to say to entity framework The certain columns in the database, uh, how it's then that done. Uh, so far, you can uh, you can imagine it already. Again, what you use is this, uh, which uses this property. So the only thing you have to say is with the property method and with the name of the field, it exists. Entity framework will pick it up. Entity framework will know that it has to write to the field uh, when uh, when. Uh, saving the data and all, uh, read from the field and saving the data and also write to the field when when loading the data. A similar thing is here, uh, where I have an entity with rich properties. So in this case, uh, I have my properties, but they have backing fields, and also they have some some rich logic. You know, like here, some again very serious logic and firing events, whatever. They are not just bags of getters and setters. Yeah. And again, in the same way, Entity Framework Core will support it. That means you can teach Entity Framework with a few very, very simple uh, lines of code. And these are those lines of code. In this case, you have property, but the important thing is this has field, various Delta Entity Framework you know, this property has a backing field called some property with rich, rich logic right to the field. Don't write over the property, write directly to the field. Uh, this is the essence of the feature. It can be fine-tuned on all levels. So if you really have a very, very complex situation, you know, where um, uh, some, some fields you want to map, some not, if you want to do it, um, uh, for example, to to write to the, to read from the property while saving, but write to the field while loading and so on. It's possible. I'm not showing this uh, in in this talk. It's let's say at, um, advanced level of this feature. Maybe I'll, I'll extend it and put some examples. But the major point is, if you want to do DDD, if you want to have rich objects, okay, uh, not only the bags of getters and setters, you can. So uh, Entity Framework Core is not stopping you from that. So again, some technologies encourage it yeah, if you do not don't know them well. So this uh, one, say well, well hidden gem, allows you really to have to have rich objects, you know, rich rich entities with, with logic and not not dynamic ones. Yeah. Yep. So for this talk, let me see. Oh, you're around one hour. It's planned. Um, for this talk. That, that will be it. It's a collection, let's say, of some of my favorites. And the collection comes from that, what I, what I see in practice, or in this case, what I do not see in practice by teams who started using Entity Framework Core. Do you have any questions? <clears throat> there are not no questions yet in the chat. So, mm -hmm. chat, last, last chance to ask a question to Igor. Let's, let's give them uh, some seconds. Not the last chance. So there can yeah. ask. For, for the day, for the day. Yeah. I don't give my details here. But uh, uh, maybe one question from my side. The good question from my side is how to proceed from here. So these were really some hidden gems. There are plenty of them which are not hidden. But how I see the development is more, more likely this, this image depict this well, um, you have your own projects. You know, you have to take this gem and, and, and gems and, and, and create jewelry out of them, you know, in different sizes for different purposes 
and so on. And then the the, the art of it is how to how to put together like existing good anti framework core features to really to really solve your problems. Where where to learn more? One thing. Um, I uh, definitely want to recommend to you is this uh, this book. It's called Anti Framework Core in Action. Uh, I agree completely with the quote: "An expertly written guide to Anti Framework Core, quite possibly the only reference you'll ever need." I have a few other books on Anti Framework Core in Action, but it turns out that I'm always coming to this one. Uh, it's it's really good. There are points where it goes in depth, and uh, there there also the book also covers architectural topics on different level. It's a really good book. Now I have to say, don't buy it. Why? Because the second edition should be out soon, covering Entity Framework, Entity Framework Five. So I'm really, I'm really looking forward. But in general, this is a joke. You can buy this one already. It's, it will definitely be helpful. That's one thing. Uh, the second thing, if you're looking in general for information of Entity Framework Core, if you still didn't start it, uh, you have excellent courses on Plural Site with Julie Lerman. And here are three blogs which I personally like. Uh, John P. Smith is the author of the book. And uh, Powell and, and Gunnar, they have some really, really good, uh, good, good articles on the entity framework, entity framework core. Uh, as I said in the examples, uh, there are readme files with links to some additional material. You can find the examples on GitHub under Irons of Talk, or you can now quickly Scan this and, and land on the on the page. Land on the, on the page immediately. Uh, so everything um, you saw and with additional material is there in the um, in the GitHub repository. Um, I think it starts so far. If you find the talk useful, please uh, give it a star um, on GitHub. And also feel free to ask questions also and open issues on GitHub if you think that. Some of the examples should be extended and so on. This is version 0.9 of the talk. I plan to add a few more things to reach this 1.0, which, which, like which I would like to have. That's it. Um, Good. Uh, we have uh, one, one question from the chat. Sure. And uh, the question is, uh, how does Entity Framework set the ID for entries with backing, fee backing fields? Uh, with, with reflection or? Uh, 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 yes, yeah. So it's the, in this case, uh, in this case, it's the reflection call. Uh, where you have to, uh, there, there are certain things in the background. So entity framework is really optimized in the, in the background for, for these kind of things. So it's not that every time it will be a reflection call. I didn't check, I didn't check uh, that part of the code, how they're doing it, but I know how I would do it so that only for the first time you have to actually calculate the the delegate to which you will write, and then later on uh, later on use that one. Uh, I'm not sure this part of the code, the Fenty Framework code, I didn't take a look so far, but it's an interesting question. Now I think I will I will take a look on my own, but I know what I would do to optimize it. Yeah, but in general, it's uh, it's a reflection base. I mean, all ORM mappers are reflection based in in their core. Yeah. Anyhow, to create the object, to call the constructor, and so on, without reflection. Good. Any yeah, that, that was the one question we had in the chat. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, if you have any others, uh, uh, feel free to reach out. So, uh, so my name is Igor Onchuc. This is how I look like you know, the exploration files when I'm on the right place uh, in the right place at the right time. And people pour uh, colored water over me. Uh, you can find me as Iron Civil almost almost everywhere. Uh, so feel free to reach out. Follow me on Twitter. I promise I'll start tweeting one day. Yeah, uh, uh, it will come. That would that would be it. Um, big thank you again for all of you from my time from my side for your time and definitely attention, or patience as well, uh, and your understanding. We had some technical issues. Yeah, that's that's how it is with streaming. It's always the question it, if everything will go smoothly. So definitely, thank you. Now it's like sitting for an hour, looking at a guy talking, maybe not the most interesting thing to do on, on Tuesday Tuesday afternoon. So thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Igor, uh, for spending the time with us. Um, 
So I'm taking now over. Yeah, Thank, thanks to you. Uh, Thank you for having me. Okay. Uh, here I am. Um, and and thanks to all of you to you uh, for joining. Sorry for the technical difficulties. I, I think I have an idea what it is. So let's hope for the next time that, to, that it's better. Um, again, thanks to our sponsors, TA to every, every and, and JetBrains. Um, for the, the JetBrains license, if you want to get, um, so we, we shuffle them. We have at the end some some feedback form, and there is some is a section uh, to fill out. Um, uh, then uh, we will shuffle this, and, and for the lucky winner, we'll send send them uh, her or him uh, the license. Um, I'm searching for my mouse cursor. So, if you want to sponsor, or your company wants to sponsor us, or you want to host a meeting when we're back finally um, uh, to be able to meet in a, in a, in a place in real life, um, talk with us. General information are on the website. Um, uh, as usual, this is the link. Um, Next meetups, um, yeah, uh, live also catched up on us. We, we want to make meetups in August, September, and October, but as you see, nothing concrete here. If you know a topic you want to hear about something, create an, an issue in our uh, topic request uh, track on GitHub. This would really help us to make a, to, to focus on finding a speaker for it. A specific topic. Um, yeah, as usual, please please spread the word that we doing this meetup. Invite colleagues, friends, your customers. Tweet at at dot net at t and yeah, invite everybody to has uh, to our meetups uh, that has to do something with dot net, or point them to our recordings that are on YouTube. Um, on to, Uploaded today, finally, the recording of the MS Build talk show. It's up, I think, in the afternoon uh, and available to watch. Here again, the links to our other places, website, Twitter, yeah. Twitch, you know, you are currently looking there, and our Slack channel. So, yes, and as usual, we want to hear from your feedback. Um, again, the link is in the uh, in the chat. Um, at the end, there is the, the section for the for the chat brains license. Um, I will wait uh, 24 hours uh, for the feedback, and then we will make the we'll, uh, draw somebody out of the pool, and we'll inform him um, and with the license. It's a 12 months license for one JetBrains product. So, um, ReShop, uh, Rider, IntelliJ, and so as, as far as I understood. Good. And uh, last but not least, we, we have again a, a, a socializing group call on Zoom. So, if you still want to hang out a little bit and, and talk with us, too many mouse courses. Um, please join us there. I will be there in in five to ten minutes, and yeah, Paul should be there. And let's 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 talk a little bit. And perhaps perhaps Igor has still some time, and if there are some questions, you can answer there. Mm -hmm. Good. Then, yeah, thank you all for 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 joining us today, and I hope. To see you now in the group call or then uh, somewhere in August on our next meetup. Bye. Thank you. Bye.